Welcome to a brand new episode of Seize the Moment podcast. And today we have a very special guest. He's Gus Lee, best-selling author of Courage, The Backbone of Leadership, and China Boy. He's a nationally recognized leadership and character advancement expert who has worked in or consulted to 50 professions and industries. He's a former corporate chief operating officer, chief learning officer, government senior executive, West Point's first chair of character development, U.S. Senate ethics investigator, acting deputy attorney general, supervising deputy district attorney, university assistant dean, U.S. Army officer, and paratrooper. And he trains and coaches with his company, Leaders of Character, and writes at gusley.net. His newest book, available now, is called The Courage Playbook, Five Steps to Overcome Your Fears and Become Your Best Self. Welcome, Gus. It's my honor to be here. Thanks, guys. Absolutely. Of course, none of that bio is true, but it gets me on wonderful podcast programs like yours. <laughs> That's hilarious. Okay, so to start off with a quote from Gus's book, Gus wrote, without courage, fear gets bigger, life gets harder, and, and contentment becomes elusive. Even the wealthy can be so fearful of losing status and riches that they can no longer enjoy freedom from material want. No one gets a hall pass away from courage. Aristotle, who did pathfinding research about how we're wired, found that courage was our number one human ability. As a recovering coward, I love this part, I took that as bad news. But I learned that with courage comes kindness, compassion, forgiveness, justice, respect, peacefulness, honesty, and integrity. Mm -hmm. Famous author J.M. Barry told college graduates that if courage goes, all goes. Even love without courage becomes resentment, hurt, and anger. Courage doesn't mean getting into the grill of a bad boss or kung fu kicking Thanos in his shins. It is not anger or physical bravery. Courage is a set of behaviors which start in overcoming your fears to make room for courageous habits. So I really love that, especially because it's so counterintuitive to the way we kind of see courage. If you think about just the way we kind of normally conceptualize it, it's sort of like this thing that we should just do, like the Nike slogan. People will just say, well, just do this thing or just overcome your fears. You know, it's like, what's so, well, this is just normal. It's kind of human nature, right? Of course, just go do the thing you're afraid of. But interestingly, what you say is essentially, I think this is the kind of point that I'm getting is that it's more so about di discipline. It's about kind of cultivating these habits that when you look at them in the aggregate, they're what makes up courage. Would that be kind of like where you're getting at? Absolutely. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, again, I also thought of courage as, oh, it's just overcoming your fears. Yeah. It's not necessarily so tied in with your character and who you are as a person, you know, owning up your own faults or uh, understanding that someone else can be at fault, not necessarily blaming others, you know, uh, being empathetic, uh, allowing, you know, allowing for self-governance and, and the like. Yeah, that's great. Let me ask you a question, if I may, both of you. Sure. What's the number one human characteristic or ability just today, just for this podcast, that you admire the most above all others. Change your mind tomorrow, but today, mm -hmm. what's your number one? So I'm going to say integrity, which okay. is in com Yeah, which, I was going to say. Really? Nice. Yeah, I was okay. going to say integrity. Yeah. Have you guys worked together before? You knew <laughs> this question was coming, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we prepared. We prepared. We got you. All right. right. <laughs> so you both, picked, you both picked integrity. Roger that. Right. Yes. Okay. Second question, mm -hmm. can you sustain your integrity if you're afraid, if you're anxious, or avoidant? Oh, that's what happens question. to your integrity. Mm -hmm. I think, I think, no, Th those things sort of block you from essentially being authentic, right? It's that's right. Whenever you give into that, it's like you're, you're sort of giving into your, to your ego and you're not really acting from, uh, you know, to put it this way, from from like your higher self. I know it's not your it best little, self. Yeah, right. your best self. Yeah, your right. best self. Right. I, I actually, I actually disagree. By the way, I think it's the opposite. I think even despite the fact that you're afraid, yes, you can still overcome. It's sort of the desire to uh, kind of sort of feed into your more base instincts, especially if you do have these higher values that you carry around. So it might be a conflict, obviously, but I think there are ways in sort of internal self talk that can help you overcome it. And that's courage. Okay. Mm. So. My horrible discovery in working in this field of courage for well now over 60 years is that my authentic self under pressure, under stress, and in the face of fear, that's my real self. And if I avoid, and if I am less than my best self, 
then I have to accept that's the real me. The rest I'm posing, I'm pretending that I can be courageous under pressure. But when I really face that thing that scares me the most, and if I have not prepared and rehearsed specific behaviors of courage to overcome them, my authentic, my real self comes out. Cowards are revealed by pressure, not mm. by calm. Mm. So authentic self, if we really want it to be the best, per Aristotle, per my teachers and mentors, you have to practice it. It's very similar to, you know, this is what Aristotle said. You want to get courage? You better, because courage impacts everything you do and everything you are. Mm -hmm. Unlike intelligence, there are major pockets of neurons missing in my head, but I can make up for it with character. Mm -hmm. I can't make up, you know, if I get double PhDs at, at Oxford, it won't make up for lack of character. It's similar, Aristotle said, to learning how to be a musician or an athlete or a soldier. You have to practice the behaviors and skills of that profession again and again and again until a fighter pilot becomes the airplane. Mm -hmm. Saying, I will be courageous when I need to is saying like, I will fly that Boeing 737 MAX when I need to. Negative. You do not know how. It's like saying, I'll box if I have to. No, you will box if you practice. Mm -hmm. And courage, unlike history and math, is not a matter of innate giftedness. It is exclusively a matter of practice. And it's totally, how do I put it, uncaring about whether you're weak or strong, tall or tall or short, of what color you are, where you came from, what your original culture and language are. Courage crosses all identity barriers and becomes essential in what we do. The, 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 other, the, the first realization, the hard one, was my real self is me when I'm afraid, hmm. not when I'm calm. The second is that I can't even love Diane or our children or our seven grandchildren if I'm not courageous, because otherwise I'll cop out. I'm tired. I work too hard. My thumb hurts. My back aches. I don't feel like it. I need to take care of myself. I become selfish. Without courage, I become self-absorbed. Mm -hmm. And a self-absorbed person can't love, lead, team, execute under pressure, or help others. Wow. So, uh, yeah, look, I want to talk about that because that's so fascinating. So we often think of emotions as these distinct entities that sort of sort of interact with one another, but kind of not really. But what you're saying essentially is that courage is an essence and the lack thereof is the foundation of these other emotions. So how does that work? How, how can you kind of conceptualize that? Well, take integrity, for example. Mm -hmm. Let's say, just for illustrative purposes, I mean, this, this book... Um, mm -hmm. I guess I'm pumping it. This book breaks down the difference between bravery, physical bravery, moral courage, which we need every day, integrity, and character. We tend to mush them all together and confuse them. Let's go to integrity. You both picked it. Let's say that integrity is doing the right thing in your personal life. Mm -hmm. okay. You could be a jerk with others but you lead your internal life with honesty, with honor, with consistency. You don't lie to yourself or deceive yourself about who you are. And you improve your behaviors in terms of your personal health and your personal work ethic. Mm -hmm. That person can still be horrible to others, okay? But let's just focus in on living rightly as one individual within yourself, in your interior life. Without courage, you're going to quit. You're going to slough off. You're going to eat bad foods. You won't go to the gym. You won't walk. You won't get required rest. Uh, rest. You'll, you'll binge on your favorite programs over and over and over again and, and live on Doritos. Nothing against Doritos in particular, but you get the idea. <laughs> Twinkies. Because yeah. you feel like it. Okay. Ergo, love, 
ergo parenting, ergo relationships, friendships, work, professionalism. It takes courage to get through one hour doing the right thing in your own life. It takes courage, takes integrity to live that one year in your own, one hour in your own life. It takes moral courage to live rightly with others for 30 seconds. Otherwise, we default to selfishness out of fear that we're not being loved, we're not being respected, we're not being recognized, we're not getting our due. And then we become unpleasant, mm -hmm. unhelpful. So it all hinges. I mean, J.M. Barry said, the, this incredible rector who created Peter Pan, said, if courage goes, all goes. And it's really true. You want compassion, you want the respect, you want diversity, you want an end to racism and sexism and bigotry and discrimination and unfairness and injustice. You lose courage and you, all of those go. When you mm. look at a leader or you look at a friend who's failing in life, mm. you will see that fear has taken control of the joystick and courage is not present. Why? They didn't know the behaviors of courage and they didn't practice them. Yeah. So. Yeah. Essentially, like uh, being courageous uh, to me, at least, is definitely being more at the cause of your interaction instead of at the effect. Right. I mean, it's it's doing the hard thing. Right. Uh, for me, once upon a time, I, I used to weigh uh, 300 pounds back in there some years ago. Yeah. And uh, congratulations to you. Oh, thank you. And so I every single day, I mean, there were days I did not want to go to the gym. I knew it was right for me to go to the gym. My mind almost intuitively wanted to give into comfort, to relaxation, to saying, ah, this is going to, this takes so long to do, you know, but I, I forced myself uh, every single day to go, even if I was tired, even if I was sore, even if I was there at least one minute at the gym, not that I would spend one minute there, yes. but even if it I was there one, minute, one minute, minute to win. Yeah. Yeah. That's and courage. Then, yeah. You demonstrated courage. And particularly, if I may add, the codicil is this. It's not only that you did it when, you know, the environment and your own feelings were in opposition. Courage is doing it particularly because you don't feel like it. Mm -hmm. And that's the progression. You go from, you know, I don't go to you go, but I don't want to go. Mm -hmm to I go despite the fact that I'm not feeling it. And then I go particularly because I'm not feeling it. Yeah, yeah. I like that you said that last part too. I used to think, I mean, this is, this is we're going some years back, but I used to think anytime, any like feeling of not wanting to go was not even me, not even like something that I really wanted for myself. It was, I, I would think, oh, no, that's the ego. That's not like what I really want for myself. Right. I should do the thing that kind of, well, I mean, this is going to sound maybe bad, but like hurts the ego in a sense, like, like that's the enemy, essentially. Maybe that's not a great way to think about it overall. But because I would treat it that way, anytime I didn't want to go, I knew going was actually the right thing to do. And it kept kind of, you know, quote unquote, beating the enemy. You know, we were talking before recording during the introductions about how all countries have armies mm -hmm. and weapons and the ability to destroy, to kill, to lay waste to civilization. Um, if you look at history, and, and I do, uh, coming from, you know, an immigrant experience, America is very interesting to me. And after almost 80 years, remains incredibly fascinating. Mm -hmm. The American Army, the U.S. Army and the U.S. military of World War II from um, December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor to VJ Day, mm -hmm. uh, 15 August 1945, just four years of war. That army defeated the three greatest tyrannies, I believe, in modern history rivaling the worst of the Roman Empire, Persian Empire, Egyptian Empire, Chinese Empire. What set them apart? 
I'm convinced that they set out to win not by killing more, but by seeking peace at the end. They did not want to dominate the world and rule Germany and Japan and Western Europe, the Mediterranean, the Pacific. They wanted to go home mm -hmm. to their families. They wanted to do real civilian jobs instead of hard, real job of war. This moral courage issue determines the outcome of nations. I believe reading, you know, Will and Ariel Durant mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, Herodotus <laughs> and, and, and Pliny, uh, Plutarch, certainly Aristotle, Plato, the determination of civilizations pivots on whether leaders and a certain percentage of their people have moral courage to live rightly instead of selfishly. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, drill it all the way down to the three of us today and people listening, it's our personal lives. It's our personal relationships. It's our loves. It's our hopes. It's our dreams for a better world. Mm -hmm. And if we are not practicing courage in the face of our fears and anxieties, and bad news and global warming, war in Ukraine, invasion of Ukraine, fears of war in Taiwan and China, you name it, fill in the blank throughout history. Life, you know, develops what the army calls, and the army says when things get bad, the wind doesn't blow, it sucks. Mm -hmm. And we don't want life to be a process of suction, of thermodynamic suction. That's not living. Living in fear is fake. It's faux living. Right. We need and, courage. And, you know, it's so interesting because that like oftentimes when somebody is uh, a little bit on the slothish side, you would think, well, you know, they're just lazy. But what you're essentially arguing is it's a little bit deeper than that. There's a sort of underlying fear that's not being dealt with. So even though we see the person sitting on the couch eating Doritos, you know, kind of like binge watching television, Netflix, whatever it is, it's like it's it's yeah, seemingly so there is an element of laziness there, but it's mostly fear. It's like fear of taking the reins of their lives, saying to themselves, OK, now I have this sort of life with no active blueprint that I have to kind of cultivate for myself. And oftentimes, I mean, the idea is if we're thinking about it existentially, there's no real blueprint for us. So what you're saying is that, hey, no, there are these thinkers in the past that have actually kind of figured it out. They don't have an exact blueprint for you, but they do have a blueprint for sort of being human. So can you talk a little bit about the actual playbook itself and what it consists of? Sure. The, the playbook is based on actually what I consider what I've judged to be immutable principles from ancient wisdom. And they cross all kinds of national, cultural, linguistic, historical boundaries. And they're from the East and from the West. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm from the East, but I will say that because we have choices in the West, I think the West got it more accurately. And I, again, I pick on Aristotle, I pick on his Nicomachean ethics, 2400 years ago and it is a blueprint it is universal and i believe that aristotle you, know, you had two choices in the west you had plato's academy mm -hmm. and you had aristotle's lyceum i'll try to do this fast because otherwise it's like you're going to head slap Plato <laughs> is about knowledge and intellect okay so you learn what justice is at an intellectual level and you do it, democracy. Mm -hmm. Aristotle, who uh, followed Plato, Plato followed Socrates. So he's the third guy. He's the he's the successor in interest, as we say in law, to the preceding giants. And he said in his Lyceum, "You must acquire moral courage first, character, arete. Then acquire intellectual acuity." Because if you reverse it, what I've seen, says Aristotle, is that people who get great knowledge, they go to Oxford, Stanford, U Chicago, Harvard, Yale, uh, West Point, mm -hmm. uh, and they get the intelligence and the intellect and the knowledge first, I, I'll take West Point out of this now, they will use that knowledge to take advantage of others in the marketplace. And they'll do it in government, they'll seek power instead of justice. 
So we have to teach them courage, moral courage and character first. So when they get knowledge, they apply it beneficently for the common good. Then democracy becomes real. Of the two choices, Plato's Academy, Aristotle's Lyceum, the West adopted the Lyceum as a blueprint. And if you look at where American America's leading colleges came from, do, do you know where they came from? Like Harvard and Yale, Dartmouth, and so mm. forth. Where from? What were they originally? No, they I don't know. Colleges. Mm -hmm. They were seminaries. Oh, wow. In order to defeat the Church of England's universities, mm -hmm. Oxford, Cambridge, so forth, so they could be uniquely American. But they taught virtue. It was Christian virtue, but it was virtue first. Aristotle would have recognized the virtues of Harvard and Yale Seminary, and he would have said, I don't get the God thing, I, you know. I think it's Apollo and we have, you know, God of war and God of wisdom and goddess of wisdom and so forth. Mm -hmm. So you set aside the deities, the principles are very similar. And that's Aristotle's Lyceum. It's a blueprint. We have abandoned the blueprint. Trying to avoid religion, we got rid of the virtues. Mm -hmm. So we've yeah. forgotten them. We've actually forgotten the behaviors of courage. We know all the behaviors of fear, anxiety, mental illness, depression, fraud, crime, violence, injustice, bigotry. We can't count the verbs that go with that. What are the verbs like integrity? What's the verb for integrity? Hmm. We know the verbs for dishonesty, fraud, bill, cheat, steal, rob, mm -hmm. dishonor, ghost. You know? right, right. We, we, I mean, the, the endless. But we don't know the verbs of moral courage, the active verbs of integrity, or the verbs of character. We know mm -hmm. the qualities, 99, you know, characteristics or traits. Those are nouns. What are the verbs? Because Aristotle tells us, and teachers of, I shouldn't say teachers, trainers of courage know that it's all verbs. It's not the what. It's the how. Mm -hmm. It's the action. Courage is not an abstract virtue. It's not an idea. It's a set of actions under pressure or in times of calm. It doesn't matter. Every universal part of life, courage infiltrates and is present for us to access. And if we don't do it, we feel anxious and fearful. We mm -hmm. worry. Right. Wow. And it's like, if you're just even in the kind of atmosphere of the university or the academy, I mean, it's obviously not the case everywhere, but it's kind of interesting as you look at just modern capitalism, where, I mean, essentially it's a market in itself. So you're trying to pump out as many people as you can, who are pretty much, uh, who are able to compete in the market and obviously compete well. And it's sort of interesting how few people actually care to take, nor even know about philosophical ethics courses. So there's so much truth in what you say that when you're, I, I remember even having a conversation about, about this. And when I was in college with a friend, of mine and she said like why are you taking an ethics course and i said to her because i'm interested in the competing views like how do you know what's right and she says well didn't your parents teach you ethics and i'm like it's actually not that simple just because there's one set of ethics doesn't necessarily mean you don't you no longer have to think about right and wrong it's it, yeah that doesn't work that way but it's so interesting how multiple people think and many people think this way where it's like when you're thinking about just again what's right and wrong it's either you use them some kind of like um you use the prescriptions given to you by your parents or you just kind of don't care at all. And your idea is like, well, like this is just modern capitalism at its best. This is what we're supposed to be like. But interestingly enough, right, your sort of understanding of that is not only is that, you know, kind of a fear-based response, but also if you're thinking about cultivating a culture or a society like this, it all falls apart. That's right. And thank you for that. I think that's a great snapshot. I didn't answer your question, so let me do that. It's okay. <laughs> uh, is there a blueprint? Yeah, there's a blueprint. Uh, how do I know that? Uh, because I was afraid of everything. And from the age when I became prescient about the difference between courage and cowardice. I didn't know the words in English. I didn't know them in Chinese. But I knew them in my heart. And I knew them in my gut mm -hmm. when I was six. 
At six, I was already aware that I was acting like a coward. I had shame, I had embarrassment, and I had moral regret. I could not articulate them, but I felt them deeply. And from that moment on, I began studying. I was drawn like a magnet, moth to flame, <laughs> uh, disciple Mentu to Confucius, a disciple to Aristotle. I was drawn to people who had moral courage. Lots of, I grew up in an African-American hood, um, the only non-African-American family. We weren't really a family, but I'll say I was the only non-Black kid on the street. Mm -hmm. There are lots of people who had physical bravery. There are only a few who had moral courage, and I, I knew them. One of them became my best friend, Tucson Street, who are still, you know, shoulder, shoulder buddies to this day as old men. And so I studied courageous people all my life and was drawn, I believe, called to understand it as a coward and to teach it to others. That's in the nature of courage. Okay, so there are, there are three fundamental steps. The book talks about five steps. Two are ancillary in order to, I would say, complete the picture. Mm -hmm. But you, the starter kit, the card starter kit has three steps. First is you have to really know your weaknesses, vulnerabilities to fear. You have to know your responses to fear. They're autonomic, they're intuitive, and we've been practicing them, you know, depending on your age, all your life. Mm -hmm. Once you identify them, you have to courageously accept that they're yours instead of deny or avoid or justify, make excuses, argue and debate or blame. Oh, maybe that's true, but it's not my fault. Doesn't matter. Get rid of all that garbage. Don't waste time on fear. We, mm -hmm. we do that too often. I, I quote Gandalf. How are you going to spend your time on fear? Mm -hmm. Bad choice. Okay. Yeah. So step number one is an assessment. And the book takes you through it. Figuring out your weaknesses. It's the opposite of strength-based approaches in coaching, which is focus on your strengths and your weaknesses will take care of themselves. In my experience, if I focus on my strengths, my weaknesses will wipe me out. It will totally defeat me. As a boxer, if you don't focus on what you're not doing right, as an athlete, as a runner, if you don't focus on what you're doing incorrectly, you will injure yourself. You could even get killed. In the military, you will die if you don't focus on your weaknesses and repair them. Okay. That's step one. Any questions about that one? Nope. Got it. Okay. So we don't do this because it's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Courage, you know, th th here's the irony. Fear is terribly uncomfortable. Anxiety and depression are awful. I, I know them well. And we think going to courage is uncomfortable. It's like I'm dying, you know, I, I've had lots of emergency surgeries. And it's like, well, if I take this anesthesia, you know, and I'll feel goofy and I'll be uncomfortable. Yeah, but if I don't take the anesthesia, guess what the surgery feels like without it? So mm -hmm. we think courage is too hard for us, but like fear and anxiety are not. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's answer the questions honestly that we find in the first step. It's just us. You know, you're in the book. You don't have to be embarrassed. No one's looking over your shoulder. Be honest with yourself. First step. Second step is stop three common human responses to fear that have become our habits. And the first is under pressure, we disrespect other people. We don't honor all people all the time. Mm -hmm. And how important is, is disrespect? Just let someone disrespect you. How do you feel? What do you think? How do you react? How long does that last inside your psyche? So obviously, the courageous person, the morally courageous person, never dishonors another person. I boxed for 13 years. I was in the military for eight years. I learned how to kill people. I have a naturally, you know, uh, cowardly nature, but combative spirit. Mm. Fight for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. um, so controlling those to honor people who disrespect me, 
to honor people who don't like me for my race, who don't like me for my beliefs, honoring that person, that takes a lot of guts. Otherwise, I become a hostile, aggressive revenger. Mm -hmm. And that's none of that is to do with card. So number one, I have to stop my disrespect. That's not easy. It takes practice. And we'll get to that with behaviors of courage. Mm -hmm. Second, I have to govern myself. I have to practice self-governance. You're right. When I sit, when I sat on the couch, when I suffered the defeat and I retreated inside myself and I ate tons of Chinese food and Doritos and drank too much beer and felt sorry for myself. I wasn't slothful. I wasn't lazy. I was afraid of failure. Mm -hmm. I was afraid of experiencing it again. So I was medicating myself. Okay. So I have to self-govern when I don't feel like self-governing and I have to do it with humility. I have to treat others as if they are better than me. Now, when I was a kid, that was easy because I couldn't, I couldn't fight myself, as I said, out of a wet paper sack. I had no honor, no respect. I had no family. Mm -hmm. So it was easy to look up at others as my betters. When life was, when people charitably lifted me from the pit and gave me skills, my instant reaction was to look down on people who were just like me 20 minutes ago. So courage, moral courage is overcoming ego. Ego is the enemy. Self love is the enemy. And to love others more than self. And to respect my my body as it was given to me, as it was supposed to be. Questions about the first two, which is the first no, we have to stop in the second step, is disrespecting anyone anytime for any reason, regardless of how we feel. Second is self-governing while regarding other people as our betters. Question, comments. So yeah, more, more of a comment. I remember when I was uh, reading, well, I was listening to the audio book and you gave an example of uh, a nurse um, who um, she was not quite uh, fit for the job. Like the, the, the directors of a hospital didn't think that she could be uh, a manager, I believe. Gracie, yes. Yeah, Grace. Okay. Yep. Perfect. Yes. So Gracie uh, C. Collins. Yeah. And it it turns out, though, that when she actually got that role, everyone was so happy to want to be on her team. And then uh, the question was posed like, why? What's what's she doing? That's different. It's it's that she was actually had an immense respect for every single person there. Uh, She treated them like the most important person in the world, essentially. And she also was not a perfect person. There is even an example in the book where uh, somebody in the nursing home uh, disrespected her one day. And so uh, she actually gave into those uh, maybe lower emotions, got a little bit angry, and maybe, I think, uh, fudged a little bit with the records or something for that patient. But because because she gave into that and she didn't act from courage for that particular instance, it actually impacted her ability to work with a a child, a, a patient who... Uh, maybe she didn't give the best care to, if I recall correctly. And then after she saw that, she's like, ah, you know what? I'm I'm not doing this again. I'm just going to, uh, she even went back to that gentleman who disrespected her, let her, let him know that she, you know, uh, sir, you know, I just wanted to let you know um, that I, earlier when you said what you said, that I felt disrespected by that. She actually had the bravery to have that kind of communication. Other people, they might have just either held on to that anger, maybe ignored that person, um, not had that discussion. But right. the fact that she was willing to do something like that, that's where she was acting from courage and also added to her character. Therefore, that's why people sort of look to her as, as a leader, uh, to my understanding. That's a perfect capture. Thank you so much. Yeah, Gracie uh, is African-American, and she ha- was absolutely mistreated. Uh, by someone on the basis of race. And she reacted predictably. Predictably for a human being, but not predictably for a courageous professional. So a courageous professional, um, I'll I'll shift gears to uh, 
Colonel Bob Howard, mm -hmm. um, a, a Green Beret in Vietnam. After a after a firefight, he would take care of his own wounded. He'd medevac them out. Do you know what the next thing he did was? Mm -hmm. He took care of enemy wounded. Wow. The people, his, he himself personally, or his, his troops had wounded. He had he he led by example, and he gave them combat first aid, battlefield first aid. Now that's Gracie. Here's here's an individual who mistreats her, scorns her for the color of her skin. She reacts, and then she realizes, I am not acting courageously. I am not acting as a professional according to my pledge. My pledge as a nurse was not to take care of people I like and to harm people who disrespect me. No, mm -hmm. I take care of human beings, honor all persons. Mm -hmm. They promised to do that. And, sh and she did it. That's where we rise on the wings of courage above the surly bounds of our own puny egos, our mm -hmm. sensitive, hormonal, quickly, you know, Neanderthal crazed egos. Mm -hmm. So is that better to live at a higher level? I used to be, my only identity for a long time was my skin color. And if you challenge my skin color, then it was Fist City. I mean, first mm -hmm. I would lose at Fist City, but mm -hmm. then when I, I learned to box, I inappropriately used boxing skills on the street, which you boxers are not to do. Mm -hmm. But my anger and my resentment overcame my judgment and my conscience. And so you 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 knock me for being uh, Asian, Chinese, uh, and you'll pay a price. Right. Mm -hmm. It'll be whether I win or lose, I'm gonna hurt you. And Gracie had that choice. I can fight these Anglos who look down at me from my skin and be angry and resentful and hateful and hostile for the rest of my life, and I'll be a terrible nurse, and I will take that stuff home. I'll be a terrible human being in my own family. I choose not. I mm -hmm. cannot resolve the injustices of the world. I can handle the injustice that I own. Right. And I mean, blame. That's guts. Right. And then it's like, ultimately, I mean, because I know we were talking about, so I, obviously, Gus, where you were from, and uh, I'm also, I would consider myself to have been from the hood. Uh, and then so for us, you know, it's sort of like, it's a weakness. So if you're kind of representing yourself in a way that's vulnerable, and you're telling another person, hey, I'm not okay with this, or hey, this hurt my feelings, uh, you know, essentially, you're doing it in a way that's a little bit more rational, I guess, somewhat more practical, that's perceived as a weakness. And then obviously, people are going to take advantage of you. So kind of coming from the streets in a way, you're thinking about how do I protect myself? And if we're thinking about what courage is, courage is kind of antithetical to that because self-protection is not really courageous. It seems that way on the outside. If you know you're huffing and puffing, you're puffing your chest out, you're making it seem like you're this big guy and like you can't mess with me, right? That's actually not courage. The reason why we kind of peacock is because we're ultimately so afraid. So I love that you frame it in a way that says like, no, this is actually not weakness. If anything, it's strength that's the, the vulnerability is the strength. It's the opposite of what we're thinking where on the other end sort of puffing yourself up and making yourself seem bigger than you are that's actually fear-based and that's actually sort of not only just disingenuous but that's not courageous right aristotle called that uh a brashness right. and uh and he tends to think of because of his times constant warfare on, on the peloponnesian peninsula uh we still like aristotle to a certain extent confuse moral courage with physical bravery mm -hmm. and too much physical bravery becomes bravado brashness peacock like posing threatening intimidating and that is not uh physical bravery and it's the opposite of moral courage mm -hmm. does moral courage can you be physically brave and morally a coward yes if you give in to homicidal rage, you can look brave because you'll take on any physical risk, uncaring of personal safety. Mm -hmm. But that's a hormonal seizure or it's a personality disorder or both because mm -hmm. they can right. feed each other. 
I mean, I, I dealt with thousands of violent criminals in law enforcement, and some of them have mental disorders that have fed into the need to be, you know, physically dominant. Right. Moral courage informs what I call the heroic moral ideal. And that person is physically strong, can physically defend others in emergencies, physical emergencies, mm -hmm. but more often, because that's those are rare events. I mean, I've intervened to help other people who were physically being attacked less than five times in my life, and I've lived in violent settings. But I've needed moral courage to treat principles integrity and character and, and to be courageous for others. I, I need that every, every microsecond of my life, largely because I was a coward, moral sure. coward, but also because I think as humans, we need that. So first no is disrespect. Got to stop any act of disrespect when we're tired or provoked, mm -hmm. like, like Gracie. Second, we have to self-govern. You can see how it feeds from respecting, not disrespecting others, then not doing anything that's wrong in your own life or with others. That's a tall command. But if we have courage, we'll take on that high standard. The third is what I call run to hideouts. And I'm an expert at this. Have you ever seen a very old movie? It's actually a documentary but it's masked as a John Belushi movie called The Blues Brothers. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So there's a documentary, a true to life, in my opinion, sequence where Carrie Fisher, Belushi's fiance, has caught him and Dan Aykroyd in a sewer. And she's now going to execute him. Mm -hmm. She's going to shoot him for having abandoned him, strike that, abandoned her at the mm -hmm. altar. Do you remember what Belushi, Jake Blues, says no. in response? No. It wasn't my fault. Mm -hmm. I ran out of gas. I had a flat tire. Someone stole my car. A friend came in, dropped in from out of town. The tux didn't come back from the cleaners. There, there was an earthquake. There were locusts. It wasn't my fault. Mm -hmm. And everyone laughs because that's us. Mm-hmm. When, when, when faced with, I made a mistake, we all become the Three Stooges or we become Jake Blues. And those are the hideouts we make, we deny, for, excuse me, first we avoid. And what I discovered when I avoided conflict is that I had more internal conflict and shame and more discomfort in the outside world mm -hmm. at choice. It's like, uh, who is it? Uh, Curly is in the boat, mm -hmm. in the rowboat. Do you know the story? Mm -hmm. And there's a hole, a leak, so it starts flooding. So he gets a drill and he starts drilling holes in the boat. And the other, you know, it's like Moses, what are you doing, Curly? He says, I'm drilling holes so the water will drain him. That's hilarious. That's <laughs> what conflict avoidance is. Mm -hmm. We compound it. So we avoid, we deny truths about ourselves. Are you cowardly? No, no, I'm just conflict avoidant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> did you did you avoid that difficult situation? No, no, I just didn't think that I could make things better. <laughs> I, I thought I'd make things worse, you know. <laughs> so that's why I I didn't run away. I just quickly left. Um, blame. That's that's, that's a, these are all acts of cowards. And lastly, give in to anger. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, as an observer of the American uh, uh, marketplace and American culture, uh, in the last 20 years, we've gone to our hideouts. They now become, instead of things we laugh at in movies, they become American cultural standbys. Mm. 
All right. Hey, so, Gus, can you speak a little bit about anger? Because so I'm wondering in terms of uh, how would that be fear based, right? Because, again, going back into kind of vulnerability and strength and thinking about how kind of puffing yourself up actually perceive is usually perceived to be a strength. So how is it that let's say if a person were to come to you and they were to say, well, you know, people are afraid of me when I'm angry. So if anything, they're the ones who are afraid. I'm being courageous because I'm the one who's kind of showing myself to be like this big yeah. guy. Right. How would you respond to that person? Anger is a fear response. Mm -hmm. uh, you provoke someone who's afraid of losing their power. Um, they, in, at the worst end, they become criminally violent. Right. At, at, the, at the low end, they become resentful. And uh, in the middle, you have bosses who will punish you, um, you know, for challenging power challenging authority, challenging, and not even challenging, but asking, can you please help me understand how you reached that decision about hiring, about allocation of resources, about whatever, about scheduling a meeting. Mm -hmm. And if you are dealing with an autocrat or a narcissist, uh, you will see the fear response. You're questioning the treasure, my treasure, which is my power over right. you. And the response is anger. Right. If you yeah. startle a dog, which means the dog is afraid, snarl. It's teeth. It's automatic. It's it's autonomic. It's it is our our primeval wiring, which we as members of theoretically an enlightened democracy, a heavily educated enlightened democracy, we are supposed to overcome. And what I see in the political scene, what I see in families, what I see in parenting and relationships, intimate relationships and marriages, is this feral response if you don't agree with me. Mm -hmm. And that's where, if we don't have the courage to listen to disagreement with grace and even with pleasure, the pleasure of an intellectual exchange, if we can't do that, then we give into fear and we've become freaked out Neanderthals. And that's modern politics in America right now. It's that all makes plenty of confrontation, anger, excuses, mm -hmm. denial of self, and avoidance of conflict while being incredibly hostile. Right. That's right. Yeah, no, denial of self, right? I mean, if when somebody, uh, let's say, provokes anger in you, I mean, if I had to think about any time I've ever gotten angry, I think, oh, um, this person thinks I'm the kind of person who would accept this kind of behavior, right? And the thing is, I guess where the fear would come from is that, oh, I'm not being seen as this this identity. Like, this is how I've tried to portray myself. So now I have to puff up and get more angry uh, to show them that, you know, you no, you have to respect me or that you can't treat me like this. When that's actually very counterintuitive. I mean, this is a sort of a saying, you know, I've seen in other places also besides your book, but especially in your book, uh, anger is incredibly acidic. It, it doesn't do anything to the other person, essentially, right? It, it only hurts you in the end, right? And getting angry and letting that take up uh, mental resources, right? Giving into that fear, so to speak, it distracts you from being sort of proactive. You're, you're still in this sort of reactive state where you're not really self-governing you're not you're not autonomous you're you're the slave of your emotions or the slave of your identity but when you actually can accept that someone maybe said something to you that might quote unquote be angering and maybe not necessarily react but instead maybe you know uh respond right but not not in a reactionary sort of a way right uh, there's a net benefit from it one that might build rapport with that person they would think, oh, okay, this is not the type of person who is so easily uh, rattled, right? So, okay, I, I kind of respect them more. Maybe maybe I'll hear them out, and then maybe we can get somewhere. Maybe this will lead to some sort of conflict resolution, if that's the context of it. Um, it's 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 very interesting. I never thought of anger as sort of like a a fear based thing. I did understand that reactionary side of it. But um, connecting it to fear is 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 very interesting. Well, Gus, did you ever have you ever seen the movie Revolver? Oh. No, I have not. 
so there's this great scene like so the the jason statham character he goes into the elevator and he's essentially kind of like zen like and buddha like and ray Liotta comes in and then so ray Liotta's pointing a gun at him and then so ray Liotta's like puffing himself up and telling him how strong and how powerful he is and he's like how dare you come into my home and you point a gun at me and so this entire time jason statham's character jake he's not saying anything he's just smiling at him and then ray Liotta starts crying hysterically crying and he starts saying oh over and over again fear me fear me fear me and then Joe, jake just walks out he just walks out as ray Liotta has a breakdown i just want to add something yeah the, the the scene right before that he's in an elevator he's deathly afraid yeah. he has a, he has a claustrophobia yeah right so he's afraid of being in elevators so what was great about this particular movie i've never seen this done in any movie before he actually has a dialogue with himself in his head he thinks he's talking to himself right but he actually ends up finding out that that's that's his ego. It's actually quite on the nose that he's te technically having a conversation with his ego. He tries to kill it, like pretending he shoots a gun in its head. Uh, all this, it keeps coming back. But then he sort of has this realization, this sort of musical score that comes up behind it, where he's like, you're not me, right? Uh, you don't control me. You know, I control you. And then all of a sudden, uh, the elevator becomes, uh, it was stuck before. It's unstuck. Lights turn on. And then he goes into that Zen mode. Right. And then Ray Liotta comes out and all right, right, right. And in the entire time, the ego is essentially convincing him, like, I'm the only one who cares about you. I'm your best friend. They don't want to hurt you. So he repeats over and over again. He says, they want to hurt you, Jake. I want to help you. They want to hurt you. I want to help you. I love you. I'm your best friend. But this is kind of what we're talking about. It's this ego mentality. that is With me, without me. <laughs> there you go. Right, right. So it's essentially saying that all of these other people are terrible and you should be afraid of them and you should try to dominate and even coerce them. Right. But I'm the one who's here for you. And so, but your book says no that's really not what makes up a good life and if anything it's the courageous person is the person who in this case like jake obviously is able to let that go and to just say hey whatever happens to me in the world will happen to me regardless of whether i'm protective or not but what i can't essentially control which is very stoic is my character right that's that's so well said by by both of you and by jake so yeah that's it let me add this and, and see if if this adds uh, a richness to to what we're exploring, mm. when we overreact out of fear with anger, or underreact out of fear by passivity, mm. you're right. I'm a worm. You can do anything you want with me. Or how dare you? I I must now destroy you in the name of humanity for disrespecting me. Um. Yes, we if we play somewhere in the middle where we do not give in to, we feel fear. It's a primal emotion. We cannot stop feeling fear. Fear is a good signal. Fear is our signal to be courageous. Instead, we misinterpret the signal, we mistranslate it, and we turn it into, you know, retreat or um, anger, both of which are destructive. So we miss the, the courage signal and the opportunity to practice courage. Mm. There are practical benefits, transactional benefits. The other person might respect us if we don't give into our anger or we don't, you know, cave. Um, it might tend to resolve a conflict. Uh, there might be more respect for myself. Let's step above that. Mm -hmm. Courage is not about results. That's mm -hmm. why few people pursue it. Mm -hmm. Courage produces the best results in the history of humankind in the measurement of results. If you've ever read Philip at the Last or Good to Great, leaders who do the right thing make 800 to 1,500% more money than leaders, executives, and companies that just go for short-term results. Mm -hmm. So courage is not about producing results, but courage nonetheless produces results. Mm -hmm. So if I say to myself, I'm going to be courageous because I'm going to get something good out of this, that's not courage. Mm -hmm. I act courageously because it is the righteous thing. Because the heroic moral ideal is about doing the highest moral action, regardless of risk to self-interest, regardless to existential status 
And regardless of approval or disapproval, regardless of popularity, it's done because it is the right thing. If I get more respect out of it as a consequence, great. If I mm -hmm. don't get more respect out of it as a consequence, equally great. Because mm -hmm. I wasn't playing the short game for my emotions or my pocketbook or my popularity index. Mm -hmm. I practice courage because I seek to be a right, a right-minded person and a right treating person, a respectful person, and a courageous identity in time. I want to play large. I don't want to play small. Mm -hmm. Not for my ego, which is saying, hey, I'm your buddy. Go destroy the other guy. Mm -hmm. Go do something selfish and stupid. Instead, I seek to be better today than I was yesterday. With the goal of becoming someone who can really be a genuine help, a genuine blessing, an asset to others. Not because I help them get ahead, not because I help them pass a test, not because I help them get a promotion, not because I help them make more money. None of that stuff counts in, 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 on the courage field of play. They're not indicators. They're not criteria. Those might be collateral benefits later, or they might not be. Mm -hmm. The real benefit is that someone cared about me, like Gracie Collins, in, in this book, she cared about her people, whether they liked her or not. She cared about each as an individual who could help patients and serve the mission of reducing pain, saving lives, and elevating the quality of life, regardless of who the patient was. Doing that for colleagues, regardless of whether they saw themselves as rivals, seeking more power, promotion, or status, she didn't care about that. Mm -hmm. Do you know how freeing that is? Mm -hmm. not be burdened and carrying all that BS around because it is yeah. BS. It's destructive BS. When you're talking about saving mental energy by not giving into, into anger, there's a bigger cost in that psychic expenditure writing beyond your, your bank account and in character and in integrity mm -hmm. and courage. Every time we give into fear and we act in fear, we, we can feel fear, and we all do. I was afraid I'd make a fool of myself in this podcast, and I may have done that. But nonetheless, that's not, that's not the test. The test is, can I share with you and your listeners how to get the courage? Because mm -hmm. I think that's important. I think it's vital. Right. So forget the fear. Forget whether I sell a book. The point is, Courage is a quality, it's an, it's an ability, it's a competence, it's a set of skills, which we all need, which we've forgotten, which we don't practice, and as a consequence, we have too much suction and fear in our lives. Mm -hmm. And and I, 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 I benefited by practicing courage. My, I, I'd be dead spiritually, emotionally, relationally, maritally, parentally, professionally without it. I'd be a dunce without it. I have a lot of education, but I'd be a dunce. I'd be a fool. Mm. So we get there by not disrespecting, stopping our disrespect, by stopping our lack of self-governance and not going to our hideouts, our cowardly hideouts of avoidance, excuses, denial, and blame. And then we go, because we have a few minutes left, right? Mm -hmm. The third step is practicing three behaviors of courage. Right. And, and you've listened to the book or read, so you know. The, the first is unconditionally, positively respect all persons all the time. Mm -hmm. Second is self-govern yourself. Do the right thing within your own life and with other people at all times. Do the right thing. You know, thank you, Spike Lee. Do the right thing. <laughs> and lastly, discern the highest moral action versus the right thing. What's the highest right action? Mm -hmm. Then do that right action, that highest right action, the highest moral action, regardless of risk yourself or fear of disapproval or 
short-term outcome. And then, and here's the kicker about courage, train others to do the same. Right. Courage is not a personal possession. I've seen people get behaviors of courage and then they won't share them with others. So they can get ahead. So other people don't know the code. Mm. You know, I discovered penicillin, but it's just for me and my family. Mm -hmm. You guys can die. Sorry, you know, but it's a competitive world out there. Right. So courage is ultimately loving others so much, so unconditionally that you will, once you get it, you will share it. And not just with your buddies or your closest team or just your team and definitely not Biff's team. You'll share it with everyone. And if you're really good, you'll share it with rival companies. You'll share it with the neighbor you can't stand. You'll share it with the relative you've never forgiven. Hmm. I love that. I, f I feel that way about the, not to make it about us or whatever, but I, I feel that way about the podcast, right? Like when we bring up, bring on somebody like yourself, the, the hope is that you know, somebody sees it and, or maybe more people see it and this sort of impacts them and maybe makes changes in their own lives. This way they could, you know, maybe impact somebody else as well. And then that person can impact somebody and, you know, could That's cause a, ripple effects, you know, and that is courage. Yeah. Courage is, is, isn't personal. It's not ego. It's overcoming ego as, as both of you have said so well, uh, in order to share courage with others, it, it's, it's the lost secret. And it, it's the it's the winning lottery. It's a winning lotto number, you know, to life. And no, no, you know, money doesn't pour out of a out of a slot machine as a result. But your your life becomes real, mm -hmm. and you become real, as opposed to a a mass of fears that you have to deal with every day because there are other people in the world that may not like you. Right. I love that. All right, uh, and. Sorry, another comment. Uh, of course, I'm definitely respecting the time here. I just wanted to say, I, I didn't get to say it earlier. Mm -hmm. What I love about your book is that it's sort of, I mean, it's called the uh, the, the uh, Courage Playbook, right? But it, it's it's also like a sort of a, a workbook in a sense. Like as I was going through it, I found myself like, for example, oh, uh, do you identify more with this statement? Like, do you sort of uh, blame yourself or, or blame others for their actions? Or do you take sort of responsibility? Or there's other other parts, like different contexts in the book where I started kind of working with it. And then you even go through processes that you can kind of take yourself from this sort of fear place uh, towards courage. And uh, I'm actually almost done with the book. I'm on the audio book. I'm about like maybe two-ish hours away from being done so i'm still i still have to finish it but so far it's it's been like i've been very self-reflective for example while listening to it and it for me it feels like it's sort of bringing me to the the right place uh where i should be thinking you know we, we always get stuck every day and sort of again the the automaticity of like just everyday right. things right but when you kind of bring your mind to like these wonderful sorts of principles and not just remind yourself even sort of even get different spins on it or, or newer information, right? It's so enriching and also uh, kind of reminds you again, like, okay, let's get rid of these sort of lower behaviors. Like you think, you think you got it, like you, you got this knowledge before and that you're good for a while, but these are things that you sort of have to instill in yourself every single day. Now it's right? character instead of knowledge. Yeah. And every question in there is a courage question. It's, it's based on a courage 360. It's based on interviewing for courage and character, as opposed to resume and accomplishments, which can be falsified. Uh, I, I have to say this. I, I know we're, we're at the mark, uh, but thank you for giving me this moment. Absolutely. The, the, you know, this book uh, has, has my, my, my name <laughs> on the cover. Um, it's not my stuff. I, I, I just took notes. Um, so much of it comes from my wife, Diane, from our mm -hmm. kids, um, from Coach Tony, who raised me from the age of seven to 17 at the YMCA, uh, Norm Schwarzkopf, uh, Tucson Street, my, my first friend in life. Um, mm -hmm. I, I mean, the list goes on. I, by mentioning a few, I, 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 I do dishonor to a hundred others. Um, and, and, and their leaders, 
they're, 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 they're people I've been honored to work for. Some of them are in the book. I can't, couldn't get them all in. Um, see, I know, I think I'm a subject matter, I, dare I say this, just by dint of time, decades, most of my life has been dedicated to understanding moral courage. Mm -hmm. And I think that I'm a subject matter expert in it only because others have shared it with me. Otherwise, I would not understand it. I only understood it gropingly. I didn't, I didn't get that it's not an abstraction. It is an ability that impacts every part of our lives and determines everything that we truly value, everything that we truly love. Those are not possible if we're afraid, if we're anxious, if we're fearful, if we're self-doubting. I'm not talking about self-esteem. I'm talking about courage to serve others as opposed to courage to feel better about the self, which is an oxymoron. Right. Not about the self, except overcoming our weaknesses, to be strong and courageous for the sake of others. And that's a full life. I've lived a selfish life, and it's thin, and it's cheap, and it's fragile, and it leaves me depressed. Mm -hmm. oh, I love that. All right, Gus, where can we find you on the interweb? Uh, Gusly.net. I'm, I'm uh, a primitive when it comes to social media, mm -hmm. but I have, I have a great friend uh, and ally and relative who's helping me, uh, Lindsay, and, and she's just a wonder. She's going to get me modern. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll be more on Facebook and LinkedIn, which I know are, are primordial but uh, maybe some other platforms as well. well. Surprisingly, LinkedIn is actually super popular. It's mm -hmm. actually, it rivals Twitter. Yeah, I actually, we get a lot of uh, like hits on LinkedIn too. So it's kind of interesting. So I know it doesn't seem that way, but yeah, LinkedIn is pretty big. So, so I'm right. putting courage tips, how to get your courage on LinkedIn as well as my Facebook page. And I have a, leaders, a leaders of character uh, page on Facebook as well. Mm -hmm. All right. I love that. Gus, thank you so much for thank coming so on. This much. was so enlightening. Thank you, gentlemen. The pleasure is mine. Make it another courageous day. Absolutely. <laughs> so we'll talk to you soon. Care. Oh, I love that. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Have a good night. All right. Well, everyone, uh, again, the book is called The Courage Playbook. You can find it on Amazon, other uh, book retail sellers. Uh, you can follow us at Seize the Moment Podcast on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. We're also at C's underscore podcast on Twitter. Like, subscribe, hit, hit the, the bell, bell on YouTube. YouTube. And thank you so much again for watching and see you next time.